Hi, and welcome to So Many Books, So Little Time podcast. My name is Jody Stapler. I'm an owner of a publishing company called Willow Moon Publishing, a podcaster, a voiceover artist, and an author. Stories are so important in our lives. And there are so many out there from independent authors and independent publishing companies that we may never find unless we trip over them on accident. So I started this podcast for people who love books and love to read and to help bring more awareness to the indie books and authors of our time. So stay with me for so many books, so little time. We are speaking to Maureen C. Berry. She is a nature and food photographer, a seafood expert, a cookbook author, and a speaker. She's a also a podcaster for uh, her podcast is Green Fish Blue Ocean. And she's an author of A Salmon from Market to Plate. Is that right? Did I yes, say that right? right? You did Salmon uh, from Market to Plate. Okay. Um, so tell, first of all, you're a seafood activist. Is that right? Or like an advocate? That's what I mean. I get it's kind of a catch all word. Um, yeah. I like to say I'm a seafood expert. I worked in the food industry for 23 years in the food service industry. And the later part of that was um, all about seafood. I sold seafood, um, in central Florida and I was a commodity seafood buyer for a fairly large account. And, um, so yeah, so now I advocate for sustainable seafood. So, right. Which brings up one of my questions. Can you explain what sustainability is? Oh, I feel like yeah. we're jumping right in this, but that's one of those words that you hear all the time. And I'm not sure people really know what it means. I, I agree. And I think when that word first came out, it had a, a big punch and a big impact. And I think it's a little diluted now. So, For me, the short kind of answer for what is sustainable seafood is a product that's harvested or caught that doesn't harm the environment, the fish or humans. And, um, and it's kind of a big thing, which is why it's really important to keep talking about it. Right. How does making sure that we're buying sustainable fish help? the environment? Oh, in so many ways. There's two two things going on in sustainable fisheries right now. Um, wild fisheries, which are a lot of the species that we typically eat. Well, actually, let me backtrack on that. Wild fisheries and then aquaculture or farmed fish. And in the United States, I think people maybe would be surprised to know that we eat over 50% of the seafood we eat is farmed fish. Right. And we anticipate by 2030 for that figure to get up to about 65%. Right. And um, is, is that a bad thing? Like a, like a couple years ago, I remember an article saying, don't eat the tilapia that you find at the store because it is farmed. It is and true. Mm-hmm. Is, is that, is it a bad thing to be farmed? Not, not anymore. I mean, certainly the history of aquaculture, it goes back centuries um, in Asia, in the United States we're a little bit behind in aquaculture production and even in terms of technology and innovation. So I don't want to get ahead of myself here right. about that because I think that's a big conversation to have. Um, so farm fish is, is good when it's done right. And unfortunately the challenge with aquaculture is in the United States is a perception with the consumer that because the media tends to grab onto all the bad. Yeah. So we see farms in Asia that are putting antibiotics or pig feces, uh, letting them drain that into the ponds, or there's an escapement with wild sam, excuse me, with farm salmon into the wild, um, into the wild, which creates some challenges. Um, but the reality of aquaculture is that it's in the United States anyway, it's, it's a big thing. Actually in the world, aquaculture is a big thing and it's trending to be much smarter um, in terms of tech and innovation, science, the challenge right now with aquaculture is the tech and innovation are moving so fast that the scientists are having a hard time communicating how to bring that to the table for the farmers. 
But farm fish is actually very good. In fact, the United States, um, the biggest farmed species of fish is catfish, U.S. catfish. And that is an incredibly regulated industry. Like you can feel very confident at the market if you go and buy U.S. catfish um, because it's so regulated, um, for instance. Um, So why is is that one more regulated than, say, like the tilapia or salmon or something like that? Why are they so good at regulating the catfish market? Well, because the United States actually has a a really strict um, regulation policy for wild fisheries as well. So we lead the charge in terms of regulation in the United States with both wild fish and farmed fish. And the challenge with the farm fish in the U.S. is that um, we're not doing it as well as, say, the rest of the world is in terms of farm fish. So um, I want to jump back to that tilapia because I think that's kind of... a, tr- a trigger that, um, and a lot of people ask me, should I be eating tilapia? That's a big question. Yeah. And, um, and you know, there's, it's, it's, it's fairly easy answer for me. So I always try to explain to people, if you're going to eat tilapia, you really need to know where your fish is being harvested because all tilapia is farmed now. Now mm-hmm. wild tilapia is from like Egypt, um, right in the Nile River, you know, there's, it's, it's a long way off from eating wild tilapia, but for the majority of us, we eat farm tilapia. And, um, the best way to figure out if you're eating the right fish is to remember a mnemonic tool that I created called PEC and I shorten it for pectoral, which is the fin on the fish. So P E C P is for Peru. E is for Ecuador and C is for Colombia or Costa Rica. So those are the three countries of origin that you want to be buying your tilapia from. And you can feel safe that that fish is um, a sustainable harvested species. And how can you find out when you're buying it if it's from one of those uh, locations? Oh, you just read the label. It says right okay, there where so it's it from. Does, it, it, so you can trust the labels. Yeah, well, it's t- the challenge with a label is, and that's a, another kind of a big thing, um, the tilapia that I see at the market is either labeled, it's either in a plastic tray, it's in a styrofoam tray covered with plastic, and then there's the store with the stamp on it. You have to right. trust your, your grocer. Um, if, if you're feeling uncomfortable, you can ask the person behind the counter, hey, can you go check on that box? I'd love to know where that fish came from. And, right. you know... It, Sometimes I do it if I'm really like just testing the market because I I know pretty much whether I'm going to buy it or not. Like sometimes I'll just see how uh, willing the person behind the counter is willing to accommodate me just so that I can have this kind of a conversation because I think people get intimidated. They're at the market. They're with five people in line behind them. They're not going to be like, hey, can you go check that label? But yeah, that's what we want you to do. Okay. Now, I also remember uh, probably it's been recent in the recent news um, that they were saying that a lot of times salmon is saying it's wild, but it's really not. So how can we tell? That's a great question. Um, When how long ago did you see that in the news? Oh, I don't know. You know what? It seems like it probably would have been in the last couple of years, but um but for, it does for pop all, up I know often. It was Ten years often. ago, who knows? <laughs> yeah, right. No, it, it pops up often, and yeah, because uh, a recent study just came out in New York State that um, I, I can't remember the exact figure. It was a big chunk of what's happening at the market. Um, they did some DNA testing, and the fish that was on the market wasn't the fish that it was supposed to be. So oh, the, yeah. um, the the distribution system in fisheries is a huge challenge, which is. Prime, kind of like one of my motivating forces to start this whole conversation and go down this path when I quit working in the fisheries industry, um, because I saw the challenges in distribution and transparency. And so the supply chain is a challenge. So if the grocery store is getting product from a wholesaler and the wholesaler is getting the fish from um, a broker or a fisherman directly from the fisherman, is that really the fish that's coming in the door or where's the mislabeling happening kind yeah. of thing? Um, so there is that challenge. Um, there's, but there is a couple physical discernible notices between what wild salmon looks like and what farm salmon looks like. Okay. So if you did a cross section, um, if you had two pieces of fish on a counter and one was 
farmed and one was wild and they were both salmon. The salmon that is farmed has a much paler orange color. Um, mm-hmm. It has a lot more white striation. They call that album. It's a fat actually. So it's a protein. It's like the album in the egg, the protein. Yeah. So when you're cooking the salmon off and you see that white kind of like, what's that right. white stuff? That's an edible product. That's protein. Most people just scrape it off because visually it doesn't look appealing after it's cooked. Um, and the further you cook salmon, the more that's going to be pronounced. Right. Um, but then the wild salmon usually has a really brilliant, beautiful shade of deep, dark red. If it's sockeye, for instance, um, the king salmon, in my opinion, tends to look the most like farm salmon because it's a, the biggest wild salmon species and it is a big, thick, meaty piece of uh, fish. So that yeah. tends to look very similar, but usually it's very discerning. You could, you could tell right away that, um, in my opinion, when you look at fish, you're like, oh, that's wild salmon. And so I think the consumer just needs to kind of start paying attention to what that looks like. Yeah. Hopefully that help, helps. What I, what I love about your book um, is that not only do you go through the explanations of, you know, f- wild versus farmed and um, sustainability and all of that, halfway through the book, it becomes a cookbook for salmon. And I'd say there's probably 30 or more recipes for salmon in there. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, that's salmon is, I'd say, probably my favorite fish to eat. And I think it's because it's got a little bit more of that meaty texture than, say, a white fish does. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's I cook it the same every single time because it's the only (laughs) way I know how to cook it. (laughs) That's but, not even, that's so funny, but not even really. <laughs> but you know, that's no how surprise. People, you kind of get in your little, you know, niche and that's where you just stay. Um, yep. And so I do love that you have these recipes in this book. Um, I'm definitely going to try like some of the soups. I never even thought about putting salmon in a soup. Oh, Isn't it's so silly? delicious. Yeah. I mean, you'd think it would be, you know, perfectly uh, normal you know in my mind because i love like you know bisques and lobster bisques and all that kind of stuff but i Mm -hmm. never even considered salmon in a soup i know very odd that's great no but it's so easy to do too because it's the last it's the last ingredient so you make your vegetable soup and then all of a sudden you're like oh i've got some salmon and you just put it cut it into bite-sized pieces and three minutes later your soup is ready and you're eating really delicious salmon soup yeah you have i mean and not only that but you break down the cookbook in how you're cooking it so if you're cooking it in the Mm -hmm. oven you have these recipes if you're cooking it on the grill it's these recipes and i love that that's that makes yeah, everything thanks. so much easier. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah the, probably the uh, the most. Go ahead. I was no, going to say the most popular. Yeah, the most popular recipe in that cookbook is the slow roasted salmon with the blueberry pan sauce. Wow. And um, I think because it's so easy, and the cool thing about slow roasting salmon or any fish for that matter, when you put it when you put fish in the oven, you reduce the amount of smell in the kitchen. And right. One of the challenges people have with cooking fish at home is the smell and they're uncomfortable with that smell. And um, so slow roasting is not only like, hey, it's in the oven. I can walk away for 20 minutes and not have to fuss and worry because on the on the grill and on the stovetop, you have to stand there and pay attention and put your timer on. Yeah. Um, so for me, I think I think that's the re- and it's kind of a cool little. Like blueberry pan sauce, everybody knows that like blueberries are like a superfood and salmon is a superfood. So naturally they pair together well, I think in that regard. Yeah, I have to try that. I've never tried blueberries and salmon together, but it makes sense. I usually go for the lemon juice and the chili powder and things like that. But that's seriously what I make every time I make salmon. And I eat salmon (laughs) very regularly. (laughs) So So where do you... uh, um, well, my oh, husband, great. yeah, my husband will sometimes buy the fresh salmon. Um, mm-hmm. Usually, um, for one, I think it's he put gets it from uh, Chile. Mm-hmm. So is that that's a good one to get from? Well, that's farm salmon. So okay. um, the cool thing about salmon, salmon, um, just like as a weird kind of fact, 
kind of if you're thinking like where is salmon being raised or farmed or whatever, salmon need cold temperatures to thrive. So they can't live in a, um, in water below 67 degrees. Right. So everything's going to be cold. You're thinking like Chile, um, Norway, like these very cold regions, the Pacific Northwest, of course, Alaska, um, they just, that's, that's where they live. Um, so as far as Chile goes, um, there's a lot of farm salmon in Chile. And, um, but for me, for farm salmon, I, I look for a very specific label and, okay. uh, um, so I don't know if you want to talk about yeah. that and promoting, cause I'm not getting paid to promote these names, but these are companies that I know and trust. And okay. so that's what I look for at the market. And then I also look for uh, where I'm buying that salmon, that farm salmon from. So yeah. one of my favorite companies is uh, Verlasso Salmon. It's V-E-R-L-A-S-S-O. Okay. They farm in Chile. And the difference with their salmon is the fish feed. So I think it's important. We'll talk very quickly about why farm salmon is a challenge. Yeah. So <clears throat> for the environment. So the three reasons that you wouldn't want to eat farm salmon would have to do with the fish feed. That means how much feed does it take to produce a pound of meat? Mm. So in the, in salmon, um, fish feed ratio, we call it fish in, fish out. The ratio is typically four to one or five to one, which means four pounds of fish feed go in, one pound of fish goes out. Mm. Um, to compare that to other proteins or land animals or farmed animals like um, beef or poultry or uh, lamb or pork, um, beef has a food ratio of about 25 to 1. So 25 wow. pounds of feed goes in, one goes out. Yeah. Um, chicken has a very... Chicken has a very low fish in, uh, excuse me, uh, food ratio. It's 2 to 1, uh, mm. sometimes 1 to 1. Um, crickets have a one to one ratio. Pork is about, um, seven or eight to one pounds. So just to give your right. listeners an idea of like when you're thinking one of those challenges with fisheries is the fish in not only the ratio, but what we're feeding farm fish. So typically farm fish, fish have to eat other fish to survive typically. Right. Um, so what in the past has happened, like in the fifties and sixties when aquaculture started to blossom in the United States, we were foraging wild fish to, to create fish feed for our fish. So those fisheries, like uh, the small fish, like mendehen and herring, <clears throat> excuse me, anchovies, sardines, these types of foraging fish that are critical for the ecosystems in the oceans are being depleted because of wild fisheries um, mm. product being pulled from the ocean to create this fish feed. Well, the brilliant thing that's happening now is we're being, uh, aquaculture is very aware of fish feed. And so Verlasso salmon has created a fish feed that doesn't have, um, wild fish in it. They created a yeast compound that mimics the principles of omega threes and sixes, which is what we look for in our fish. So their fish ratio, their fish in, fish out is about one to one. And it's as, it's as good as you're going to get like in any type of farmed kind of species. Um, so that's a very good product. And then the other challenge that we talk about with fish, farm fish, is escapement and disease and affluent. And affluent is just waste. So imagine a fish farm under the ocean. It's a great big net just sitting underneath the surface of the ocean. And all the fish are swimming around and around and around. So the fish feed goes in. Well, the fish have to poop. So where does the poop go? Mm. Um, well, it goes to the bottom of the ocean. So yeah. if the currents aren't strong enough to move that effluent away, then it just sits and sits and sits and depletes the oxygen in that layer of water. So that creates a problem for the ecosystem because if there's no oxygen in that water, then coral and crab and fish and everything that's sitting on the bottom of the ocean has no oxygen to survive. Um, which is why in Chile, they move the pens around. Um, okay. So those pens are very movable. So they don't just sit there for 10 years. They actually move them um, throughout the system. So there was a, that was a big mouthful of information. No, um, so, so, so let's it's a see. good thing that we're buying that, that salmon. 
Correct. So you want to look for for lasso salmon. You want to look for North Atlantic salmon that's farmed up in on the um, Atlantic coast up in Canada. So that's a really good, and you'll see, you'll find these primarily at, um, the big mega stores like the Trader Joe's, the Whole Foods, the Fresh Market, that kind of thing. Um, we don't typically, like I have a Kroger, for instance, here in Western Kentucky that I shop at. And typically I don't see that farmed fish in my mm-hmm. market. That fish that I'm looking at is a product of Chile. That's literally what it says on. And so I don't trust that source. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't buy that fish, but right. I know that's a privilege. I know that's a privilege. And yeah. um, so what I recommend for people is um, because salmon is such an important, healthy fish to eat and health experts would agree that it's better to eat that little bit of salmon um, once, once a week for if you're eating fish twice a week and you want to have salmon once a week and you are on a budget um, and you can't afford wild Alaska salmon, which can cost almost $25 a pound. Yeah. Um, okay. That's a challenge. If you can't afford that and you still want to eat that fish, um, then I would suggest either check the freezer aisle because frozen wild fish like coho is typically in the market. So at Kroger here, uh, we have Alaskan coho salmon in the freezer. So okay. um, if that's your budget, that's where you go. Instead of, yeah. oh, look at that nice fish, like at the fish department, you know, sitting there that right. says product of Chile. Unless it's a particular, um, unless it's a particular label. And then there's okay. another label too, um, but I'm going to get it wrong. So I'll look it up and remind, you'll have to remind me. Okay. I don't want to get it wrong because I, right. I'm blanking on that, another and label. Okay. So, but yeah, you want to be very particular about those labels. Okay, so when you buy it, like uh, we some we also buy the frozen, and it mm-hmm. says wild Alaskan on it. However, you said about um, the color of the fish, it lo- it's very pink. It's not as deep salmon color oh, as. So does that mean point. it's not mm-hmm. real? No, no, oh, no. I'm so hard? sorry. Oh, that's okay. It's a different. No, no, no. It's a. I'm so glad you brought that up because I didn't mean to indicate that all wild salmon has that brilliant bright oh, red no. color. Okay, um, yeah. Yeah, so coho salmon, which is a wild Alaskan species, and then pink salmon, which is, they also call it chum, but it's for marketing purposes. Nobody wants to call it chum. Um, (laughs) But in the food world, we we know it's called chum fish. Um, But it's pink fish, which is typically the the species that's used um, for canning. Okay. So when you open a can of, or a pouch of can or, um, pouch salmon, you open it up and you're like, Oh, it's that nice pink. It's pink salmon. They're smaller species of wild Alaskan salmon. So coho salmon tends to be a fairly pale color. In fact, it's like a pale pink or a blush color almost, okay. um, as opposed to that, that, that kind of orangey, um, farm salmon. So farm salmon is consistently always that orangey, um, kind of a warm yellowish, I want to say a, on the yellow spectrum orange, okay. as opposed to when you're looking at king salmon, which is the first salmon species. And then, um, this, the sockeye salmon, which is the most brilliant, um, and has the lean, it's the leanest fish. And, um, it's the prized fish because visually you look at it and you're like, Oh my gosh, look how beautiful that fish is. Right. It's bright red. It's so beautiful. Um, but then as the season goes on, the wild salmon season goes on through the, through the season, May through September, the fish color tends to, it gets softer and softer. Right. Okay. So when you're looking at the market, the most, the, I say the workhorse salmon, the workhorse wild Alaskan salmon species is coho salmon. So it's affordable. It's plentiful. It has kind of that pale pink flavor. That's typically what you're going to find in the freezer aisle. Okay. And so we always recommend shopping the freezer aisle for seafood. Okay. And I, I usually do cook it in the oven. Um, as mm-hmm. I said, it's pretty much the same right. way every time. But sometimes I do over, I feel like I'm overcooking it and that white, um, what did you call it? Al- al- album. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I, album. album. Mm-hmm. Um, I, that, you know, is a lot more than, um, I think it should be. And does that mean it's overcooked? Yes, probably. Um, (laughs) There's no way to get around it, probably. So here's the other challenge with home cook. Most people overcook fish because they're unsure. Right. Right. So we tend to use a general, I have a general rule 
where I say 10 minutes per cooking per inch of fish. So coho salmon is probably a half an inch thick. Right. Right. Okay. So five minutes. And what temperature is doing that in the oven? Sounds like ridiculous. You're like, wait, right. what? Yeah. <laughs> um, wait, what? Um, probably like 375, 400. Okay. So I am way when you are my <laughs> No wonder it's no good as, as, as yeah. as good as not as good at home. <laughs> and then the other thing that you would know, the other way you would be able to tell if you were overcooking your salmon or your fish, was specifically with salmon, since we're talking about that species, yeah. um, it tends to get really chalky tasting. Yeah. Okay. And you're just like, what is this? Is, right. You know, that's an awful sound for a podcast, but right. like where you're just like, oh my gosh, it's so dry. What's happening here? Yeah. So it gets yeah. very dry and chalky. Um, I tend to cook fish to medium. When I have fresh salmon, I tend to cook it medium to medium rare. Okay. Um, when I go uh, frozen, I still cook it medium. So here's the other thing about fish, which is most people probably know this, but when you have, say you've got it in a sheet pan or you're finishing it in the oven or you throw it on a baking sheet and you bring it out and it's sitting on the counter and you're getting ready to plate everything up, that fish is still cooking on that pan. Mm -hmm. That heat is still, and fish is a delicate, you know, piece of flesh. So, um, yeah, so less is better. We always say less is better. Okay. And so with frozen fish, the, the other thing with frozen fish, which I think people aren't familiar with, is um, you want to keep your fish frozen until you're ready to cook it. And then keep it in the package and run it under cold water or put it into a shallow container and put like a weight over top of it, like a cup or something, to keep it submerged in cold water for about 15 minutes. And okay. then take it out and then pat it dry with paper towels as much as you can. The, that's Sometimes a great people, tip, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes people, you pull it out of the freezer and then it's the next day and you're like, oh, you know, and it feels soggy or wet or whatever. That's the best method is to keep it frozen until you're ready to cook it. Okay. Sounds good. That, so see how that, see how that works. I've been doing out. this all wrong. So it's a good thing that you were oh, on. <laughs> yay. <laughs> I mean, not yay that you're doing it no, wrong, right, but like, but that I'm yay, learning. you're going yes. to get it right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I mentioned before on the podcast that I actually, from the time I was like 23, 22, something like that, um, until my, I got pregnant with my youngest daughter, who is now nine, I was mm -hmm. vegetarian. And oh. so we didn't eat anything of any kind mm -hmm. of meat, any kind of fish, anything like that. But I started craving meat when I was pregnant with my youngest child. Mm -hmm. and so. I figured salmon was the closest thing without not feeling like I was doing something wrong. So, mm -hmm. you know, I never learned how to cook meat and salmon right. and fish. And so I, mm -hmm. I do my best. <laughs> yeah, I'm still, I hear I, you. It's only been like nine years, um, which I know may seem like a lot, but that's, you know, I, like I said, I grew no, up most of my adult life never cooking any kind of protein like that. So it's I'm, all I feel the meat. same way. Mm -hmm. I get it. Um, one of my favorite ways to cook salmon is um, on the stovetop. And this is typically with wild fish. So I'm, this is my splurge because it's expensive to buy wild salmon. Yeah. Um, but the stovetop method is like the best method. Okay. So for me, I just do, um, so I heat my skillet to on medium and with a little bit of like canola oil or, some kind of neutral oil with a high smoke point. So medium to medium high heat, you want to get that pan super hot. I Sometimes I put the timer on for like three or four minutes because I'm busy in the kitchen and I don't want to forget that the pot's, you know, just sitting there waiting to get hot. Yeah. And I use, I have an induction burner. So it depends on if, whether you have gas or electric or induction, whatever you're cooking with, it depends on how quickly um, your pan is going to heat up, right? Mm -hmm. Once that pan is hot, um, I just season my salmon with salt, with kosher salt. I'm fairly liberally on both sides. And then I either do it two ways. So if, if I, if I want to pull the skin off, um, I'll start with the skin, I'll start with the skin side up. So I get a nice sear on the top mm. and I put the fish down in the pan and let it sit there. And just when you do that, you want to make sure it's in the exact space you want it to be because 
you want to resist touching that fish because that flesh heating, hitting that skillet is going to create that nice sear. But right. if you move it too soon, you're going to lose that sear. So I think that's kind of a challenge, like resist that urge to move that fish. Make sure you put it in the exact spot that you want and set your timer for like two to three minutes, depending on the thickness of the fish. Um, and then when you flip it over, just throw in like a pat of butter and okay. a soft butter and fresh herbs. And my, my favorite combo is, um, parsley, rosemary, basil, and the ratio is like three to one. So, um, so that's, that is all chopped up, ready to go. Okay. Once that yeah. fish goes in and I set that timer for two to three minutes, I chop my herbs, flip the fish, throw the butter in herbs on top, let it melt down. And then I start to baste, tilt the pan, take a spoon, start to baste that buttery herby um, over the top of the fish and yeah. continue cooking for two to three minutes. And, um, and then you're done. I think I and know so what then, we're having for dinner. Yeah. I mean, it's so, so, <laughs> yeah. so it's like, oh, so good. So you want to make sure all of your sides and your salads are ready. The table set, the wine is open or whatever you're doing, you know, make sure it's all ready to go. Make sure the kids are in like, you know, screaming distance, like, yeah. hey, let's go. Dinner's ready. Because <laughs> right. that fish cooks very fast. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. You're you know, welcome. I don't know if you know this, but we're recording today on my birthday. So I feel like this is like the perfect <gasps> birthday <Yay>! dinner. <laughs> Happy birthday to oh, thanks. you. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. That's exciting. Yeah. Right. So I really feel like that's going to be like the perfect dinner tonight. Cool. So, yeah, I know what I'm I making. have. A, um, I have a YouTube video that's showing that technique. Um, okay. So if you want to head over to my YouTube, um, it's called King Salmon with strawberry mint quinoa. Ooh, okay. So you got to get through the, it's about two and a half minutes. So yeah. if you want to fast forward through the quinoa making. Well, that'll be good um, too though. Yeah. You'll see the technique and you'll, cause I think visually you, you know, you hear it yes. and then you're like, I need to see that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So where can people find you on YouTube? What is your YouTube channel? Uh, it's Maureen Seabury. Okay. And I don't think I have enough followers to actually have like a, uh, YouTube. Oh, okay. Well, uh, so we you know just I mean? search, yeah, search Maureen, Maureen Seabury. Maureen Seabury. And, and you can put salmon in there. That's probably, uh, um, another little thing that will okay. come up. Perfect. And then, um, you also have, I believe, Twitter as well. And do you have Instagram? I do. Um, I, so funny thing about Instagram. Um, I started Instagram when I had no idea what I was doing and right. I used my name, my handle, Maureen Seabury. And then I let it go for a couple of years. And then when I was like, oh, I really need to be on Instagram, um, my handle was taken, but I couldn't remember my password. And I don't think I can't figure out how to delete that. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So I'm Maureen C. Barry okay. on Instagram. Okay. So make sure because you're a photographer. So I'm assuming that the pictures you post are just beautiful. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. Um, so I do have two Instagram handles. One is Maureen C. Barry. Maureen C. Berry, which is the seafood. Yes. And then I have Maureen C. Berry photography because that's where my wildlife photography is. Okay. And that's Wonderful. also on Instagram. And mm -hmm. then you have your website, which is, is that Maureen C. Berry.com? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also your podcast, which is Greenfish Blue Ocean, which I love, by the way. I've been listening oh, to that thanks. and I love how you do it in alphabetical. And you choose, like, say we're on H, and then you, all the fish that we're talking about start with the letter H, and I just love that. Yeah. Oh, thanks. It's it's actually marine. It's um it's actually greenfish blue oceans. Oh my so, gosh! You know so. I knew that. It's so That's it's fine. so hard. I got. What did I say? Fish, blue fish. No, you said ocean, and it's plural oceans. But I think oh, people ocean. would find it if they. Okay. If, yeah, I think yeah. if they looked it up, greenfish. Yeah. So season two, I'm actually um, getting ready to batch season two, which is taking a little different direction. I'm not going to do the alphabet this year. Oh, okay. I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do aquaculture. Oh, cool. Okay. So each, yeah. So each episode will talk about the type of aquaculture because it's such a broad category. It's like the word sustainable. When people hear aquaculture, right. they're like, what does that mean? Right. So I'm going to define that and then um, talk about the different types of um, fish farming and then the fish that come with that. And then uh, the types of fish that you would be eating and how to cook and whatnot. Yeah. So I think it's a very important podcast for people to listen to, to find out more about the seafood that we're eating. 
And oh, um, so I hope people really listen to it. And when I, I thought I've been saying on accident, green fish, blue fish, when I've been talking about it with people because of the <laughs> book, green fish, yes, or of course. red fish, blue fish. Right. So uh-huh. I thought I accidentally said that, but okay. Green fish, blue oceans. Yes? Correct. Okay. Very That's good. Yeah. <laughs> and also um, make sure everybody goes out and gets this book, salmon from market to plate. Um, it's available on in Kindle and in print. Um, and the nice thing about the Kindle book is that you it links to the pages that you're going to. So if you're reading one chapter and you want to talk about uh, wild salmon, you can click on the the little blue link and it'll take you right to that page. So it's it's an actually really awesome Kindle book to read. Thanks. It is kind of a cool the way the designer set that up. I I was so hopeful um, that she was. She was super savvy. And I said, this is really what I want. I don't see this often in books, but I want to have some, you know, interlinks to take people yeah. over. And uh, so she did a good job. So, yeah, thank it's you, very, Megan. very convenient. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Megan. Um, but yes. And thank you. I want to thank you for sh- uh, sharing all of your knowledge with us today, because it's You're it's so really welcome. important. And a lot of people like me. Um, you know, we're kind of going into this blindly and trying to figure it out on our own. And it's so good to have an expert. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you so much. much. I want to thank Maureen Seabury for joining me today and talking with me about her book, Salmon from Market to Plate. And also thank you for that great recipe for my birthday. It was delicious. And I want to thank you for joining me on So Many Books, So Little Time. Let me know what books you're reading, what authors I should interview, and give me your suggestions and comments. If you appreciate our podcasts, books, music, and our goal of helping others fulfill their artistic career dreams and would like to see it continue for many years to come, please join our Patreon and become a sponsor at Willow Moon Publishing. Make sure you subscribe to So Many Books, So Little Time podcast so that others can find me and all the great indie books and authors that I'll be sharing throughout this podcast. You can join me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at So Many Books, So Little Time Podcast. And you can check my website out at jodystapler.com or email us at so many books podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for joining me and come back next week when we delve into another story.